Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <coughs> it's a privilege to be here. Thank you, David and, and Mark, for the invitation. Um, I guess we're not talking about cricket this morning. So <laughs> just keep quiet about that. I, I didn't hear anybody say anything, so I was waiting for it. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a joy for me to be here. Um, <coughs> and uh, I bring greetings from Carl, Pastor Carl Hargrove as well. He said I must, uh, he doesn't know many of you guys. He knows some of the Living Hope guys, and he knows obviously Mark. Um, but he sends his greetings nonetheless and says hopefully he'll be able to spend more time in Cape Town soon. So let me just open my notes here. <clears throat> right, I want you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, and we're going to be working through this passage from verse 17 through to 22. And um, I've entitled this morning's message, Trusting in Troubled Times. I, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that everyone here agrees that we are living in crazy times. We're living in troubled times. Uh, everywhere you look in this world, there seems to be conflict happening. There's more wars happening today than I certainly can remember in my lifetime. And, um, <clears throat> and obviously all of us are very aware of the challenges we face right here in our own country. So these are very definitely troubling times. There seems to be an un underlying wicked agenda that is really escalating all over the world and it's frightening to all of us and as Christian men and as Christian fathers and and business leaders and members of our community we we have the added bonus of within these times having to lead our wives and lead our children and lead our colleagues and lead our friends and our staff through these troubled times it's not easy we have to keep a high road. We've got to stay positive. We've got to see, be seen as pillars, right? The, the strong ones. And so how do we do that? And of course, as believers, as men, our standard answer is to just to have faith in our God. It's a good answer. But do we always really practice that in our own lives? Do we, do we really believe that? But it's a good answer nonetheless because it's informed by what we know about God. For instance, we know that God is the one and only God, right? Amen. Isaiah 46, 9 says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. And then we also know that He created all things. So just as we think about God, those things that inform what we believe we also know that He's created all things. Colossians 1.16 says, the Apostle Paul said this, he said, For in Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. He created all things. And then we also know in the very next verse, Paul says, And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So we know that God sustains everything. Even though to us it looks like Things are going crazy. God is the one who still sustains. He is the one who sustains all things. We know that He's omniscient. We, knows, we know that He knows everything there is to know. We know that He can do whatever He pleases. I love this Psalm 135, 6. The author says this of God. He says, whatever Yahweh pleases, He does. Yeah. Simple as that. And then, of course, we know that He rules over all things. King David attested to this in 1 Chronicles 29, 12, when he said, Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might. So as we read these texts, we, we, we know our God. We see our God. We know that He's mighty. We know that He's awesome. We know that He's majestic. We know that He's powerful. We know that our God is sovereign. But while, while we know all these things, in our weakness and in our frailty, we still struggle at times to walk confidently in these troubled times, right? Yeah. 
I know I do. And so this morning, we're going to look at how and why God's people were able to walk with comfort and with confidence when they were going through tumultuous and through troubling times. So turn with me to verse 17 of Exodus chapter 13. It's a passage that tells us a lot about God and He's dealing with His chosen people, the Israelites. And um, at the opening of the book of Exodus, we see a huge people group that had developed in Egypt. And they came from the 12 sons of Jacob. You all know the story, of course. And it was to their descendants that God had promised a land. He promised them a land when they'd grown big enough to occupy it. Big enough in number to be able to rule over it, right? And so the book of Exodus is interesting. It tells us about how God deals with these people at this stage. Now there are four events that take place in the book of Exodus. The first is the Passover, which you all know what happened. And then you have the crossing of the Red Sea. And then you have later on you have the giving of the law in Sinai and ultimately the construction of the tabernacle in the desert. Now the first two of these events have to do with the deliverance of God's people from bondage in Egypt. And it's right before the crossing of the Red Sea that Moses makes this declaration found in our passage today. Now I'm not going to read the whole thing just for the sake of time. We'll, we're going to unpack this passage and we're going to go through it verse by verse. But in this passage in verse 17 through 22, Moses gives us three great truths about God. Three great truths that remind us of the sovereignty of God. And as we are reminded of His sovereignty, it helps us to trust Him in these troubled times. Firstly, in verse 17 and 18, Moses is going to tell us about God's providence. And then in verse 19 to 21, Moses is going to tell us about God's faithfulness in keeping His promises. And then in verse 21 and 22, uh, Moses is going to assure us of God's consistent presence. His consistent presence. So let's look at these three in more detail. Verse 17. It says, Now it happened that when Pharaoh had let the people go. Now I want to stop there for a minute. Because it's interesting when you go back to the text, the Hebrew text, the sense that this passage has is that he was saying, Pharaoh didn't just let them go. He didn't open the door and let them out. He literally threw them out. He just said to them, get out, get out as quick as you can, just go. I don't want any more of you. And we know, of course, that that was in response to the final straw, and that was the killing of all the firstborn in Egypt. You all know the story. And then as they leave Egypt, Moses, the first thing he tells us is the way that the Lord took them out of Egypt. He says this, he says, God did not guide them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. So you ask yourself, why would Moses tell us the way that they didn't go? Surely it would make sense if he told us where they went. So it seems a strange thing to say. But I believe, friends, that he does that on purpose. He's, he's not wanting us to know uh, exactly where. He's wanting us to know something about God in making that statement. Why do I say that? Well, what do we know about God? We went through some of it earlier. We know that He's sovereign, right? We know that He is omniscient, which means He knows everything there is to know. And so, with just those two things in mind, we know that when God rules over the whole of the universe, He does so knowing everything there is to know about the entire universe, right? We all agree with that? And so, as He rules the Israelites, we know He does so from the perspective of knowing everything there is to know about these people. So, He, he rules them knowing their needs. He rules them knowing their weaknesses, their frailties. He knows their circumstances. He knows their fears. He knows their desires. He knows what is best for them. 
And we've got to know that He knows what's best for every one of us here. He knows what's best for our families, our children, everything. Now, we don't, we don't know, as we read the text, we don't know the exact route that the Exodus took. But we do know what the route was not. It says, it says there in the text, it says it was not by the way of the land of the Philistines. Now, this was essentially from the Nile Delta all along the coastline to Canaan. But the important thing I want you to note here is that we're not so concerned about the route. Because the emphasis in this verse is not on the route, but it's on God's leading of his people. Even though Pharaoh was the one who kicked the Israelites out, and even though Moses was the one who was walking in front and leading his people out, it was God who was directly leading his people. So what does he do? Well, the shorter route, as I said, which runs from the Nile Delta all along the coastline up to Canaan was only about 240 kilometers. Tutmos III took 15 days to get from Egypt to Canaan. So it's a short route. And it seems the best way to go. Why wouldn't you go that route? That's where you want to be, right? I mean, who would not want to go that way? It's green, it's flat, there's plenty of food, there's plenty of water. I mean, who wouldn't want to go for a ride along the beach? That would make sense. But the problem with that route, friends, is that that route was populated by the Philistines. These were a powerful fighting nation. They were a fighting force. And even at the time of the conquest, 40 years later, even at Joshua's death, that part of the country, that part of the land, still remained unconquered because they were so powerful. And so, had the Israelites gone that route, which seemed the easier way, they would have run straight into the Philistines, who would have drawn them into conflict. God knew that Israel was not ready for war. He knew their weaknesses. They just spent 430 years living in the, most, the best place in Egypt. They'd spent 400 years making bricks, they weren't ready for war. They were slaves. They weren't fighters. And they'd had no time to train for war. They left very suddenly. And running into the Philistines would have caused them to fear and would have caused them to want to go back to Egypt. That's why in the second half of verse 17, Moses says that God didn't take them along the coastal route. This is what he says. Lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. And so verse 18 says, Hence God turned the people to the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in battle array from the land of Egypt. Now this concept, friends, is very important for us to grasp. The longer route gave them time to organize themselves as a nation ready to fight a military campaign to take Canaan. And here, it shows us God's providence over His people, even in planning the route of the Exodus. Now we know, sadly, from the very next chapter, that as soon as the Israelites ran into some trouble and some hard times, they quickly grumbled against Moses and against God. And they said it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than for us to die in the wilderness. And it seems like such a crazy statement to make, right? I mean, what did God just do for them? What did they just witness, the miracle? And yet they grumble. The truth is that the reason God took them the way that they considered to be a curse was to make it easier for them. You see that? They certainly didn't see it. Because the wilderness is a hard place. It's rough. Earlier this year, uh, my wife Tanya and I, we had the privilege, uh, Mark and Debbie were there as well in Israel on the study tour with Dr. Grisanti. And uh, we ch chatted about this on Wednesday. Uh, we, we actually drove through a wilderness very, very similar to that. And uh, all of a sudden, our, our professor stopped the bus 
and he kicked us all off the bus. He said, leave everything, just take your Bible and go off into this desert and just go and read some, pass some scripture out of Deuteronomy. There wasn't a blade of grass to be seen anywhere. There wasn't a tree to be seen anywhere. There was no shade. Uh, it was 45 degrees. Uh, there was a hot wind blowing. The sun was beating down us. It was brutal. Mark can attest to that. And um, it was so hot. And as I stood there with my wife, and I was really, I can't even remember what I read out of Deuteronomy. It, it was miserable. All I could think of was to get out of that sun, get out of that wind, out of the heat, onto the bus with the air conditioner so I can drink some cold water. That's all I could think of. And you know what I did? I grumbled. And right there and then I repented in my heart for the many times I read this passage uh, in, in, in Exodus and judged the Israelites because I realized how tough it was out there. But I also realized how easy it is for us to grumble when we look at our surroundings, when we look at the challenges around us and the circumstances and we forget. Maybe we don't even realize that maybe what we are going through, maybe the hard time we are going through, maybe the trial we are struggling with is because God in His loving providence has ordained not to put us through something else which would have been way harder for us to deal with, right? Amen. Moses is telling us no matter how hard the wilderness way was going to be for the Israelites, in God's kindness, it would not be as hard and not be as difficult as the way that God could have sent His people. In His kindness, God knows our weaknesses. He knows our frailties. He knows our fears, but He makes sure not to put us through anything that we cannot handle. Amen? Amen. We can also be comforted in knowing that whatever God leads us through in life is both best for His glory and for our good. That we can be assured of. And it's hard to believe even when we are burdened under severe trial. But friends, it's true. God is showing us right here in this text that we can stand on His providence. Let's move on. We saw the providence of God in verse 17 and 18. And now we see the second truth in God's passage, this one. And that is His faithfulness in keeping His promises. Verse 19 and 20. The promises of God. It says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall bring up my bones from here with you. Now, once again, this is a strange story. I mean, what? Moses digging up the bones of Joseph and taking them with him? It's a, it seems like a very odd thing to do, right? But it's not so odd when you think back to Genesis 50. Let's turn back to Genesis 50 for a minute, uh, verse 24 through 26, to see what's going on here. What's happening as Moses is collecting the bones of Joseph to take them with him? Well, firstly, we see that there, right there, there is a commitment being fulfilled. Look at verse 24. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he swore to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made them promise that they would take his remains with him, with them, when they left for the promised land. And friends, I, I don't believe that Joseph here was being sentimental. I believe this has to do with the sojourn of God's people. It started with a struggle between Joseph and his brothers. We know the story. Him being sold into slavery in Egypt and then him rising to power and to a position of influence and then being in a position to save his family and then settling his family in very favorable, favorable conditions in Egypt and then 430 years of growth as a people group and as a nation 
before coming out of Egypt. It all has to do with the sojourn of God's people. And what's at stake here is not sentiment, but covenant. The reason Joseph asks his brothers to take his, bone, the, his bones with him is because he deeply believed in the covenant of God. The covenant promises of God. He's saying to them, brothers, I know that God is going to take you out of this land. I know that He's got a promised land for us. I know He's going to take us there. So when He does, you take my bones with you. That was the faith of the patriarchs. And by digging up Mo Mo Joseph's bones and by taking them with him, what Moses is doing in front of all the people of Israel is he is displaying exactly the same faith that Joseph had. Now you ask yourself, what's the point? Well, I remember in 2017, I decided to, to give up my business, uh, to sell everything, uh, pack up life here in South Africa, and to pursue my seminary training. And, uh, and so what my wife and I did, is we moved from a very comfortable life uh, in a country that we knew well, in a town we knew well, amongst people we knew well, and we, we, we set all of that aside. We moved to Los Angeles to a place we didn't know, where we knew nobody, no people, and, and we were facing an uncertain future. We didn't know what the future holds, and I remember how scary it was. It was a scary time for us. And, um, and then I thought to myself, what must have been like for the Israelites? Yes, they were unhappy in Egypt, but it's what they knew, right? And yet, here we find them facing an unknown future, standing on the edge of an unknown wilderness, and they must have been very, very afraid. And so what they needed most right there and right then was a solid reminder that God never forgets His promises. And so after 430 years, uh, faith in the promise of God is demonstrated by Moses as he digs up those bones and as they prepare to leave Egypt. And the whole of the nation of Israel saw that faith and it reminded them of God's promise. But there's more than that. More than just an expression of faith. What's also becoming clear to the people as they see this happening, and they think back to Genesis 50 and to what was said there, and they realize that the, the promise that God made and the, the, was happening right in front of their eyes. Digging up those bones made them realize, guys, things are about to happen. Things are starting to happen. And so Moses reiterates the promise of God, quoting Joseph verbatim as he tells the story. And they knew, they knew without a shadow of a doubt that just as God was faithful to Joseph, he was going to be faithful to them. And so it is for us, friends. So it is for us. No matter the circumstances we face, no matter the trials we face, no matter the choices we have to make, God's sovereignty and His faithfulness to us never ceases. We can trust Him in this. And so for Israel, they demonstrated their trust in verse 20. Look what it says. It says, Then they set out from Succoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The edge of the wilderness is key here because on entering the wilderness, Israel had officially exited from Egypt and it means they took a step forward and moved into this crazy wilderness. It was a step of faith and they were willing to do that because they had a very good reason. This brings us to our final point. We've seen the providence of God in verse 17 and 18. We've seen the faithfulness of God in keeping His promises in verse 19 and 20. And in verse 21 and 22, Moses shows us that Israel was willing to enter into the wilderness because of the presence of God. In verse 20, Israel is standing right on the edge of the wilderness. 
And so you ask yourself, what did they have going for them right there? Number one, they had the memory of what God has just done for them in, in delivering them from Egypt. They, they'd seen the force and the power of God's hand at work. They'd seen the plagues. They'd seen what happened at the Passover. They saw the defeat of Pharaoh. And secondly, they also reminded of his promises in the bones of Joseph. Whenever they doubted or had any doubt, all they had to do was look at that box of bones to be reminded of what's happening. But God gave them something else. He gave them his presence. Watch this, verse 21. And Yahweh was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light. That they might go by day and by night. Now you might think to yourself, I mean this is a desert. It must be super hot. We were there. It is. It must have been super hot. So this cloud must have given them some shade and brought some cool. And then you think about the fire at night. You know, it, it, desert can get very cold at night. For anybody who's been in a desert, it gets bitterly cold. And so that fire could have, must have been there to give them some warmth. But the text does not indicate this at all. Rather, the cloud and the fire went ahead of them to lead them. And it represented to them God's leadership. It was his presence leading them, moving them through an unknown territory. And because they knew it was God, they were willing to follow. It was the way of allowing the Israelites to physically look at God and be able to follow him. We know that the text says that no man can look at God and live, right? This was a way that they could actually physically look at God as he was leading them. And also they knew that he was with them every day. All day, every day, God was present. And because of this, what seemed to them to be a terrible route to go through, could be trusted. They could trust God. The pillar wasn't just a sign from Yahweh, it was Yahweh Himself. Friends, these were God's chosen and beloved people. He was with them. He was there to care for them. He was there to provide for them. He was there to protect them and to comfort them. And through it all, He was there to remain near to them. Now sadly, we all know the story, right? We know that sooner or later, Israel turned their back on God. And they started worshipping false gods. And ultimately removed His presence from them. And He punished them with exile. Very sad story. But in God's graciousness. And in God's kindness. And in His mercy. And in His grace. He did not leave it there. That's not the end of the story. Because centuries later. He sent His Son. Jesus Christ. He sent His Son to once again dwell in the midst of his people. Okay. The cloud and the fire were manifestations of God's presence leading in front of the Israelites. But Jesus came to dwell in the midst of the people and to make possible again a relationship, a true and real and intimate relationship with God and his people. A relationship that was destroyed by the sin of Adam. And by his death on the cross. And his resurrection. Jesus made atonement for that sin. He restored that relationship. He made restoration possible. He paid the penalty. He took the guilt upon himself. Of all of mankind's sin. And for those who believe that. To receive his righteousness. And his sinlessness upon themselves. Incredible. And then sometime after his resurrection from death. Jesus ascended into heaven. And according to his promise. He sent the Holy Spirit. And he sent the Holy Spirit. So that we might enjoy the continual comfort. And the continual presence of God. It started with God's presence in the desert. Right? 
And then God's presence came in the form of Jesus. So from leading in front of His people to dwelling in the midst of His people, what does the Holy Spirit do? It dwells within us. How incredible is that? The Shekinah glory of God. Seen here in this passage of, in Exodus, in the pillar of cloud and fire now takes residence in our hearts. That's an amazing thing. That's how near God is to you. If you have been born again by the Spirit of God, through belief and faith in Christ Jesus, He dwells within you. He's comforting you. He's taking care of you. He's strengthening you. He's guiding you, even in the midst of these troubling times. Right? So what do you need right now as you are going through a wilderness? What do you need if you are going through a trial or you're suffering through something or even if you're just struggling to come to terms with the world the way it is right now? Number one, you need to recognize with awe and with appreciation the providence of God in leading you. The providence of God in dealing with you. And then also... We need to remember with incredible thanksgiving the covenant promises of God that we have in Christ, right? We have a hope. We have an eternity ahead of us. We have a promised land in heaven that's waiting for us, right, brothers? Amen. So this world that we live in is not our home. That's our home. And He's going to take us there if we are born again, truly, by His Spirit. And you can be assured constantly of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in your life as a believer. Those are the three things. And with that in mind, you can and you will walk in comfort and in confidence and with courage and with peace through these troubled times, no matter what. Friends, if we belong to Him, will He not be present amongst us? That's what we see in Scripture, right? And the practical result of that, the practical result of knowing that the Spirit of God is within you, is joy. Joy. David speaks of a joy that only the righteous can know. Psalm, 100 and, Psalm 16, verse 11. And that joy is but just a foretaste of the joy that is to come. A joy that's everlasting when we see our Lord face to face. Right? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to you for your word. We're grateful to you that as we read your word, you show us your providence. You show us your faithfulness to your promises. You show us and prove to us once again that we don't have to worry, we don't have to be concerned even in the midst of trouble and trial and turbulence and tribulation and all those things that we know are coming in this world and that are here right now, we can walk in peace and in comfort knowing that your Spirit is with us, guiding us through it, taking us through that wilderness, strengthening us. Father, we are so grateful to you for your Son that came to dwell amongst His people, your people, to make restoration with you possible for each and every one of us. And Lord, for those who may not know you today, we just do just pray that they would recognize the incredible act of grace of Christ. Dying on the cross, re being resurrected unto life, taking upon himself not just the penalty for our sin, but also the guilty verdict, so that we can walk away not just having our our debts paid for, but the certificate of debt cancelled, as if we've never sinned. What an incredible thing, Lord. And to that end, we give you all honor and all glory, and we worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.